Hello, welcome to Film Talk. My name is Bob Dutton, and I'm going to be your host for the next hour or so as we go through another class of film analysis. This is from the Martha's Vineyard Film Society, a nonprofit organization on Martha's Vineyard in Massachusetts. Uh, if you would like to make a donation to the Martha's Vineyard Film Society, or you care to become a member or renew your membership, you can do so at www.mvfilmsociety.com. So thank you for even considering. So while, you, while I've got you here, um, let's take a little look at what we're going to be doing today. We're going to be dealing with the wonderful world of plot structure. And there's an actual structure to it. And this applies to every story that you have ever heard, seen, or created in your mind. Plot structure. So you don't need to take notes, but this is the type of thing that once you can get this, once you can understand this class and exactly what I'm teaching you in this class, once you can understand this and apply the information, oh boy, you can go into every story and figure out what is happening. You know, it's the, the, the type of thing that plot, as we defined in an earlier class, is, uh, it is the sequences of events that tell the story. So it's this happening, then this happening, then this happening, then this happening. And so it goes down the line. It is in chronological order. This happens, this happens, this happens, this happens. So plot structure. And the structure we're going to look at is a mountain. So get your seatbelts on or your skis on. Get them on tight because this is going to be quite a ride. Enjoy. Because we're dealing with the wonderful world of plot today, I'm going to show you a couple of films that you probably have not seen, a couple of short films, uh, as well as clips from films that you are familiar with. Plot is the essence of what happens. So if you're reading the description of a movie, usually you're given two things, sometimes separately, sometimes together. And those are theme, which we've talked about in an earlier class, in terms of the, the, the moral, the message of, of this film. And the other is the plot. What is actually happening in it? So, you know, if it is a, you know, a journey around the world, that is action. So plot are actually actions. They're not necessarily um, characteristics of a human being in terms of, oh, you know, Jerry was a nice guy. That's not plot. That's character. Plot is action. This happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. And by identifying the things that are actually happened, it allows us to go on the journey with the characters. So I'm going to start off with a rather interesting story called Lazy Boy. And I'll talk to you on the other side about it, but this is a film that will probably uh, confuse you at first until you figure out, oh, I know what's going to happen next once the film is over. So here it is. It's called Lazy Boy. Lazy boy. It's been good to me. Yeah. Sure, it's comfy. You look like a nice bloke. What do you reckon? 30 bucks? 
deal. <laughs> yeah, use it wisely, mate. Use it wisely. In here, babe. What's that? Isn't she a beauty? Picked it up at a garage sale. How'd you go with the baby stuff? Ah, uh, no, nothing. We don't need another chair, eh? Yeah, I, I know, but this was a bargain. Yeah, well, put her with all the other bargains. <laughs> So you're never going to believe what happened in this garage sale. This van came out of nowhere. Where'd you get your damn filthy, stinking boots? Off my damn car! Jesus, Ray, what have you bought now? Shouldn't you be in the kitchen? The kid, unbelievable. No, don't get up, Ray. You look like you've had a hard day. I want that thing out of here. What are you doing, Ray? I've got to show you something. This is a time machine. Please, I have to go to work. No, no, really. When are you going to grow up, Ray? But... No, you must think I'm a fool. Look, I'll show you. What are you doing, Ray? Look, you're not going to believe me. But this is a time machine. Oh, Crazy, I, I, I know. 
but think of all the amazing things I can do. Oh, God. Yeah. My friends are so right about you. What? You're selfish. You take me for granted. And you're going to be a lousy father. Right, this kind of thing was cute back in the day, but you have to get your shit together. I have to go to work. We'll talk about it tonight. Right, Dad. What are you doing, Ray? We've had fun, haven't we? Good times. Yeah, of course we have, babe. But. You know, our lives are about to change forever. We have to make plans for the future. You, me, and our little girl. I'll see you tonight. Girl. Bucks. Deal. Now, use it wisely, mate. Use it wisely.
Now, does your chair do that at home? What's interesting here with this story is that you're learning what happens, but your brain wants to put things in chronological order. And so when you repeat a minute and a minute and a minute, you think, okay, well, you can erase those first ones. It's like, no, because even though time goes back and forth, the time for the character continues in a single path. And so that line is his time. His going back and forth in time is irrelevant to his personal journey, which is I'm going to start here and I'm going to move here through time in a chronological order. So obviously when he gets to the end, he finds that he has now entered a loop that he will never get out of. He's always going to go with this because he, any chance he had, he blew because he became no smarter in the end. So we'll talk about these unusual journeys back and forth in time. But now I'm going to show you another short film. Uh, this film is called Alma. It is, uh, it is kind of creepy. Enjoy.
So, wow. Um, makes you not want to get a doll anymore. Um, this film, Alma, is the story of a doll. Not about a little girl. This is the story of the doll, who, or actually of the, of the store, full of dolls that traps children, almost as if the children were, was its food. I'm going to pull you in. And if you noticed, you want to go back and you want to look at it again. If you noticed at the end, the picture of the outside of the store, it almost looks like a face. The windows, and it looks like it's got eyes and teeth because it eats children looking for their souls. By the way, in Spanish, the word alma means soul. There you go. So uh, what happens, what happens, what happens, what happens, what happens? That is the story of Alma. And the fact that she goes into the doll. It's a whole other world, but it is still the, the, the story going in chronological order. It's just her perspective of life changes because she gets sucked into the doll. So want another doll? <laughs> okay. So uh, next... Uh, I'm going to lead you into the world of, uh, of plot structure, of how every story is, in essence, made of the same fabric. It's just different sizes, different embellishments, uh, you know, but it is, uh, a un it, it is a unique story whether if, if you've watched all the things in the in the various classes we've we've had a 30 second tv commercial that told a story we have had we've watched a uh, part of harry potter in the deathly hollows all eight harry potter movies follow the exact same idea as that 30 second tv commercial of course, there are adjustments for length and for height and width, but thing. But all, ultimately, a plot is a plot is a plot. And with that, I need to reintroduce you to the most important sentence I ever give my students when it comes to analyzing story. Here it is. Every story is about someone who wants something and is having trouble getting it. If you understand who it is and what they want, and whether they get it or not, and what gets in their way, you will understand that movie. So let's, let's think about this. So in terms of plot, who it is, what they want, what gets in the way. And so the story of someone trying to achieve something, that is the story, that is the plot. And so the complications that ensue by conflict force us forwards. So here, here's, here's a way to define it. Characters in conflict create plot. Characters in conflict create plot. So if you have a problem, you're going to have to do something about it. And doing something is what a plot or story is about. Some action is, is taken in order to pursue a goal. And that is what a plot is. It is the story of somebody pursuing something. So with that in mind, here we go. You might want to get a piece of paper. You might want to write this down. You might want to take a picture, a screenshot or something like that, because here comes the mountain that I promised you. Okay. So now I have a series of graphs to show you. And because I uh, am showing you these graphs, I'll be talking in the background so you don't have to look at me anymore. Lucky you. Okay, um, these graphs begin with this mountain. And as you can see, this is a mountain that's got some other lines on it, uh, but it looks like a formidable mountain. And indeed it is because this is what every plot looks like. Whether it is a 30 second TV commercial, it is a joke that somebody tells you it is a, uh, the, the entire Harry Potter series of seven books. Uh, it can be War and Peace. It can be an episode of The Golden Girls. 
plot is the same thing. The, the, the length of the mountain, the height of the mountain, and the various uh, crags in it uh, will change. But essentially, this is what you're looking at for plot. So when we look at this, uh, it is on an x-y axis. axis, And the axis, y is always the axis that goes up and down, as if you take the letter y and follow the, the, the stem in the middle and just follow that down, there's your y axis. So uh, with this, uh, the x axis, in other words, from left to right, indicates what uh, you probably have already figured out. This is in terms of uh, a graph is time in chronological order. And I say in chronological order because that becomes very important. The reason it becomes important is because almost every story, there is information that is out of order. Whether somebody tells you what happened last night or five minutes ago or 3,000 years ago, your brain automatically adjusts and put things in chronological order for you to understand it because it is a logical order that you can understand. And so... Uh, by having things in chronological order, even though they're delivered out, out of order, you have a firm understanding of what is happening. So next, where this red dot is, it's the intersection of the X and Y axis, that dot is very important. What that is, that's, that symbolizes the beginning of the story. So the start of the story is right there. If you're in a book, this is everything after the prologue. So um, even in movies where there may be something that, you know, it's like, you know, it may say 1938 and there's a scene and then the next thing that it, it, the screen will say, and now today. And so you get to see what uh, this little prologue of something that has happened that's important, that, that background information. That is, we'll, we'll get to that information in a while, but this is where the start of the story is. Generally, page one, the first minute of the film or TV show. So you start here, uh, which leads us now to our next area, which is this area immediately to the right of it. It is called status quo. And the status quo is the state of things. So this is how th things are like. During a movie, during the status quo portion of the film, we will meet the characters, particularly the protagonist, we will get to understand the setting. Where are these people? When are these people? What are their relationships like? What are their jobs? Uh, and what is the reality in which they live? And if you want to know more about reality, you can go back to a previous episode. But basically, uh, re reality means the uh, realistic world, or what, what is realistic in the world that these characters inhabit. So, uh, example is Superman uh, is not... Uh, in, in a real world, people would recognize that Clark Kent and Superman are the same people, but in Metropolis and, and within the context of Superman, they don't recognize him as being uh, the same person. So that is the reality in which those people live. So that leads us to this next part, part which is the blue dot. And that blue dot becomes very important to what is going on with this story, because at that point you can see the mountain starts to rise. And we'll talk about what that rise means in just a minute. But this blue dot here represents what is called the point of attack. It has other names in other places where you see plot uh, structure broken down for you. But I'm going to use the word point of attack because this point is very important. And it's so important that something happens here that is essential to storytelling. It is the key behind why we are interested in a story. And that is this thing called the major dramatic question. So at the point of attack, the major dramatic question is asked. And it is always a yes or no question. And it is and we follow this story until we get a yes or no, until this question is answered, where we are absolutely sure that this story is not over. I will use a sports example for you. If you're watching a basketball game and your team is ahead by two points and there's 10 minutes to go, you are going to stay fascinated as to what's going on because you don't know who's going to win. Now, if your team is, uh, is 20 points ahead with five minutes to go, you're pretty confident that you are going to win. 
Uh, if your team is 30 points ahead with two minutes to, to, to go, you know there's no way the other team in two minutes can score 30 points. And so at some point you come to the realization, it's like, okay, my team is going to win or it's not going to win. It may come down to the last second, but it definitely, for some people, happens very early. And that's why they leave the arena after spending hundreds of dollars on tickets to get to their cars to avoid the traffic going home. They say, oh, the, you know, hey, it's got five minutes to go. I say, well, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't really care. My team's ahead by 25 points. They're not going to lose. And I don't want to have to deal with an extra half hour of traffic. So goodbye. In other words, they have answered the major dramatic quick question for themselves is, will my team win or will my team lose? But hopefully win. Um, so the major dramatic question, we're going to follow that and come back to the point of attack yet again. And when we analyze for plot, this is something that we must absolutely understand. So next, you have the, the mountain starts to rise and the peaks and the valleys and the crags in the mountain there. This is what is known as the rising action. There, These are where the complications happen. And it's because we have these complications, you can see that the mountain gets higher and lower and higher and a little bit lower and higher. And so eventually you're re reaching, going to a peak. So what does this other axis mean? What does the Y axis on this chart mean? Well, what it means is uh, th this is where we get our tension. And so the tension is an important aspect of what we are looking at because the tension is what keeps us going. What is rising? The tension is rising. And you say, okay, wait a minute. The opening scene of Jaws. You know what I'm talking about. The opening scene of Jaws. There's tension there. And that happens before the point of attack. That happens during the status quo. Opening scene of Jaws. Ready? I'm about to show you the opening scene of Jaws. Enjoy. What's your name again? Chrissy. Where are we going? Swimming. Slow up. Slow down. I'm not drunk. Slow down. Wait, I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm definitely coming. Whoa, hold up. What? I can swim. Just can't walk or dress myself. <laughs> Come on in the water. Take it easy. Take it easy. Okay, so Jaws, opening scene. There was a lot 
of tension in that scene. Enormous amount of tension in that scene. This girl is being eaten by a shark piece by piece. We don't know what's happening underwater. We don't want to know for sure. But it is full of tension. And yet, if you look at our chart, during that section, which is the status quo, it's flatlined. It, it, it is not tension. There's no tension there. Why? Why does not that, that status quo, why doesn't it rise there with tension? Because the tension is only in regards to one thing and one thing only. And here it is. The idea of tension, as you can see on this chart, is this is tension in achieving the objective. Attention in achieving the objective is what we are looking at. So the goal of uh, the major dramatic question is, is, to, will the, is to answer the question, will the protagonist achieve their objective? We haven't met a protagonist yet, so we can't ask that question quite yet. So we get to this next point, the yellow dot at the top of the mountain. That, of course, is what it referred to as our climax. And the climax is the point of greatest tension, you know, in, in the protagonist achieving their objective. And so that does not mean it is the most exciting part of the movie necessarily. It means that there's the greatest tension, the least likelihood that the um, protagonist will not achieve their objective. And so th it gets very exciting and it is followed almost immediately, sometimes sometimes within the second, sometimes five minutes later, uh, at least within the story, of where this purple dot is. And this dot is very important because it connects to other things on this, excuse me, it connects to other things on the mountain here, particularly the point of attack. What we reach here is what is known as the resolution. And the resolution is exactly when the major dramatic question is answered. So the major dramatic question is, will the protagonist achieve their objective? It starts at the point of attack and it ends at the resolution. The resolution is like, oh, my team has won the basketball game, therefore it is over. Even though there are other things still happening, the tension is, is now seeping away because, ah, uh, yes, we have an answer. Now, this is... Uh, the point of attack starts what is called a story arc, which ends at the resolution. Understanding these two points of a story is essential for you to understand what actually happened. You take the plot, you find the point of attack, when the question was asked and when the question was answered. And sometimes, because as you should already know, having watched this series, that you start by the end of the movie to figuring out what happened. And so by starting at the resolution, oh, at this point, I realized we had a resolution. We, we, are, we, okay, this person was not receiving it. Well, then you go back to the point of attack. When did the problem begin? And so that will help you identify the objective or not the objective, but the uh, antagonist as well. And so understanding who the who or what the antagonist is and at what point they were defeated or successful, and what point did that problem begin? And so the story arc is, uh, particularly in uh, soap operas, you're going to find there will be multiple story arcs, story arcs happening at the same time. And so you'll switch from one story to another to another. And until you get to the resolution until you get to the end of the story arc, you are quite sure that this is not over yet. And you'd be right. Coming up next is our falling action. Our falling action. In other words, the tension is, uh, is seeping away very quickly. Uh, this is also what is known as the denouement which in French means the untying of the knot. So all of that tension, all that frustration, the knot, the tension starts to go away because we're solving all the problems. And this is where often subplots are resolved. You know, where minor characters, their own personal, personal objectives uh, are met or not met. And so we get to see that. But 
uh, it, uh, it allows us to sort of decompress as we wait for the rest of the movie to, to uh, answer all of our questions and therefore we can walk out pretty confident that we either enjoyed or did not enjoy what we saw, but we certainly understood what we saw. Now, this leads us to one other thing that we have yet to talk about. And that is at the very beginning of this chart, in the green, before you get to the status quo, before the start of the story, we have exposition. Exposition is expository information, expo exposing the past. So this is information that happened before the beginning of the story that is still part of it. So you may learn, for instance, in the musical Annie, is that we know that she is an orphan. Oh, well, that's old news. That, that happened well before the, the story began. Oh, and her, her parents dropped her off. And so when you get all this information about her past, it's like, oh, oh, I get it. But as the story of Annie continues, they try to learn what ha actually happened to her parents. Are they going to come and pick her up? And so uh, FDR sends out, uh, you know, the, the I guess, J. Edgar Hoover to go figure out what's going on here. And they learn that her parents died 10 years ago. So that is expository information. And this, as I said at the very beginning, our brains put things in chronological order. That is just our nature because we want to have an understanding and the logical order of things is logical. So all of that information happens in the exposition. And sometimes that expository information will shift the size of the peaks in the mountain or whether they actually exist, because there may be a piece of information that say, oh, I was worried about that. Now I realize I don't need to worry at all because those two, those, those two are related and they're, tw oh, they're twins. Oh, and it's all making sense now. Before you even get to the resolution, some things may be solved or they may be complicated based on exposition, particularly in murder mysteries. You're going to get, you know, somebody, the, the detective asking somebody a question and they learn information about the past that allows them to start putting things back into correct order of time. And so their understanding of what happened and when it happened allows the detective or detectives to solve what the mystery is. So that is that entire thing that you see there from exposition to falling action. Those are the important points within a plot. There are others that I will not tell you about right now because you don't need to know more. <laughs> this is enough for now. But there are other things, and particularly if you get into longer pieces, they get a little more complicated. But at the same time, remember, with longer movies, you ultimately have multiple stories going on, more than likely. You have minor characters with their own objectives. You have multiple objectives with from your uh from your protagonist. You may have objectives from your antagonist. And so you're dealing with a variety of different plots. And so understanding in a movie where lots, an ensemble film, where lots of things are happening and people are living their own individ, individual lives. And so when you, you're following five different characters and, and what they're all looking for, then you are looking at five different stories, even though they're happening at the same time. So every uh, if you see, look at this mountain here, every peak within the mountain going up the rising action is the exact same thing. As the tension goes up, then the tension goes down. Then the tension goes up, and the tension goes down. Then the tension goes up, and the tension goes down. And so the objective is not just one objective. It is a series of smaller objectives. We'll talk about that more when we get to an objectives class. Uh, but for the time being, you just need to know that this is rising action leading to a climax, a resolution, and falling action. So with that in mind, I'm now going to show you a, uh, a short film. So hopefully you can uh, apply what you've just learned to what you are about to see. Uh, I'm going to purposely make this a little difficult for you. But uh, at the same time, we'll talk about it on the other side. This is Mr. Bean once again joining us for another Film Talk class. Uh, this time he is at the library.
って
Mr. Bean, yet again, you do not fail to amuse us with your selfishness. Um, Mr. Bean, uh, of course, uh, jeopardized his own success in terms of achieving his objective because he had to come back for his bookmark. Oh, oh, well, then again, we didn't want him to ruin any more books anyway. Um, before I get to talking to Mr. Bean, I want to... Uh, show you the mountain again, but I'm going to show it to you in a completely different way. Years ago, while I was teaching this, something just clicked in my brain. And so I now uh, review plot analysis in a completely similar, but completely different way. So here we go. Going to, going to the slides now. Here we have a valley, not a mountain, but a valley. And a giant snowball uh, that is being pushed by a friend of yours. And I know it's a friend of yours because uh, in the middle of this, uh, represented by the red X, that's you. You are in a middle of a giant snowball. As if somebody was making, uh, you know, trying to build a snowman and you got caught in one of the giant snowboulders. And so your friend is pushing you and you think, wee, this is fun. Push me some more, push me some more until... Your friend is uh, up on the top of the mountain there and realizes that with one push, you keep rolling and rolling and uh, wait a minute, um, things are out of control. So what happens is you hit that first bump, then a little more, then you hit another bump and then crash at the bottom of the valley. It's a whole bunch of snow with you there. Oh, isn't that fun? And the fact that you are uh, down there, your friend who's still up at the top, if he or she was a real friend, they would do what any friend should do when, if, when you're in trouble, text you. Yep, they're going to text you. And here, what they're going to text you is like, are you okay? And as, you know, if your friend is texting you, of course, you want to text them back. So you've got an option. You can say, uh, yeah, yes, I'm fine. Or your other option is uh, no. If you have the ability to actually text somebody back. So what are we looking at here? We're looking at the exact same mountain for plot, but I flipped it upside down. And the point of attack is, you know, is the point where the snowball starts to roll by itself. When you no longer have control of a situation, you have a problem. As long as it's still within your hand, your, your grasp, and you can control it, it is not a problem. And so the are you okay is the point of attack because that's what you're thinking. As soon as the ball starts to roll by your, by itself, you're thinking, oh, I hope this person's going to be okay. And so that thought is in your mind. And until that understanding of whether your friend is, is going to be okay is answered, you have a story arc. You, you, you do not have a resolution. So, so on the other side, the answer, the yes or no, the major, major dramatic question is answered at the resolution. So that's a yes or no. Did the protagonist achieve their objective? Are you okay? And it's either going to be a yes or a no, just like any other major dramatic question. So there it is. So that is plot in the reverse. Well, and just, just presented to you in a different way. So... Ultimately, it's the exact same as the mountain. The problem begins when you can't control it anymore. And at that point, you have a major dramatic question in your head. And until that question is answered at the resolution, this story will not be over. That's it. 
Okay. So, are you okay? Yes or no? So, Mr. Bean's problem is when he is when he writes in the book. He's on the tracing paper. He turns his head. He sneezes, and then he starts writing in the book. He realizes he has a pro he has a problem. Instead of admitting to his problem, he goes about trying to erase, making a bigger mess, and then putting white out. <laughs> white out in this antique book, making it even worse, trying to cut the pages out, making it even worse. So he's just making his situation more and more difficult. And therefore you see the mountain, the hills, the tension goes up, the tension goes up, the tension goes up. Just when he thinks he's fixed something, he makes it worse. When he thinks he's fixed something, he makes it worse. And so the tension, the hills go higher and higher and higher and higher. So that's where we look at plot, the, the actual things that are happening. And so you can determine plot by actually identifying the things that happen. And those are the things that Mr. Mr. Bean did. Don't have him fix your, your pool or your, your refrigerator or your washing machine that he, no, no, not going to happen. Okay. Now another film. A short film, a an animation. Uh, this is a uh, this is a real kicker. Um, this one is called Destiny. Enjoy it. Oh. <sighs> Hmm. 
Remember when I told you we were going to watch this movie Destiny? That, much like Lazy Boy, is somebody living one passage through time. However, the conflict is not about him at the very beginning. He is not the protagonist. The second guy through is not the protagonist. The last guy through, he is the protagonist, and he sees other versions of himself, but those other versions are not, they can't even see him, but they are not the same character. It is, it is the third time, the character in the end. He is the one who has learned from the past because this is information he has. And so all of that information leading up to that third pass is status quo. It is the state of things. That is the condition. That is the, that's the way things are. When he wakes up, those, that's the conditions. Those are the things that he knows, even though he's got very little time. He knows all those things. And so they establish for him that is the story. And it's a wonderful life. Clarence the An Angel spends the first half an hour learning about George Bailey. And all of that information is exposition. The first hour of It's a Wonderful Life is exposition. When Clarence finally comes to George in Bedford Falls or Pottersville, that's when the action begins. The action, the plot, the things that actually happen, the pursuit of a goal. We will talk more about It's a Wonderful Life in a future film talk called Guardian Angels, because there's a very specific difference between those stories and others. And It's a Wonderful Life and Clarence are a perfect example of a Guardian Angel movie. So, next up, here's another one for you to watch. Chloe! Meg! Yeah, back here, Meg! Up, keep it up. Cheers, Carla. So we're going to yours for food. <laughs> He's hungry, she's hungry. Let's go. Mine? Yeah, it's yours. Come on. Let's go. Dude, I got stuff to do. Oh, do it later. Yeah, dude, it was easier than before. You have stuff. Yeah, I knew my stuff. You have the principles memorized? Yes. Respect, responsibility, reasonableness. <laughs> but you got it in. Yeah, yeah. Dad made sure of that. I don't know, dude. I don't know if I can just be bothered. It's like when Daniel's captain would literally spend every second month with Mr. Zekas. Yeah, who else can get it though? Me? I actually heard Bridget uh, from camp said she applied last week. So. What are you do? I can't imagine anything worse than Bridget as school captain. Sure. Now I hope I do get it. <laughs> she could get vice though. Please kill me perhaps. God, Connie, you smell like egg. Mm. No, no, no. It's okay. Oh, 
It's an insult. Yeah. 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 I mean, I try to use as much deodorant as I can. Yeah. Oh, Mrs. Wilson's had a busy day. Is that lace I see? Oh my god. Oh, dude, that's hot. <laughs> oh, uh, you, you left something there, buddy. Where? Oh, there, right. right. On the bed. <laughs> you can pick it up for me instead of being a flub. What's that? <laughs> dude, like, what is that? Do you have something to tell us? Like, like, do you sleep with him? Like, on your chest or something? Like, yeah. <laughs> just squiggles. <laughs> shirt off, shirt off with Mr. Squiggles right here. I was like, hey, hey, hey. I'll be I'm back. I'm better. I'm saying all that. Are you sad? Yeah. What's up? Nothing. Huh? Dinner's ready. Yeah. Yeah, me balls. Video. Wow. Yeah. Like, it's not like we're gonna spread it around or anything. Just, just with the rest of the team. It's just Mac being a dick. You know what he's like. I don't know. I, I didn't think you'd. No. Be the type that. No, you're right. I'm. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have looked at. I'm sorry. It's fine. Right? Hungry or something? Yeah, dinner. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
group chat of the, um, the boys on the football team and they were sharing photos of girls from my year but mainly from years below and they were rating them and saying things about them that were not right and laughing about it and then I found this video Hey! Back down, back down, back down! Oh. <laughs> Fuck, I'm talented. You're talented as yeah. shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bring it, boys. Hey, what's up? Um, what you and I had spoken about, right? Like, you, you didn't tell anybody anything, did you? Oh, like, I'm sorry, I'm just... Stay. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm just kind of freaking out right now. You didn't tell anybody what you and I had had, had, spoke, had spoken about, right? Hey! You did What? You told her? No, 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 no. No, 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 I didn't tell I her. I told you she wouldn't No, 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 I didn't Stop. tell her. She found it on my laptop, So what the man. fuck does no, that no, no, mean? She did... I know I shouldn't have seen wait, it. Wait, wait, just... wait, Carla, I don't understand. You told me it was fine, right? Yeah, and you then told me I it guess... was cool. I just felt kind of gross about oh, it after. Fucking okay, hell, Carla, well, what is your problem? What is your problem? Wait, hang on, hang on, hang on. Oh shit, Carla, I don't know. Hey, we hey, might just get some of this because we're on careful. Hang on, careful. Oh, fucking sense of humor. Oh, I'm sorry, oh. I didn't find it as funny. I don't like it's serious humor. Funny, funny, funny. We're going. Come on. Fuck you. I didn't want to get you in any trouble. I just. Ugly fucking bitch. Come on. Fuck you, Matt! Whoa, 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 whoa! Fuck me! Wait, wait, wait! Fuck! Wait! Stop! 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 Carla! I think you should leave now. Okay, there's a lot to talk about with this film. Uh, this is uh, definitely a dramatic film. And if you remember um, in class number one, which was called uh, Sympathy, uh, I discussed the whole idea of a moment of honesty leading to an act of bravery. Uh, and this is a perfect example of a film that does exactly that. You, you usually find that in, in, in dramas less so than comedies. Um, this film is uh, one that is a whole lot about character, but there, but the plot is uh, definitely important in impacting these characters, particularly when you deal with teenagers and people who are vulnerable and people who are unsure of who they are as human beings. Um, their actions sometimes um, uh, are, are against character. 
uh, and for objective is because I want to be liked. I'm going to do something really stupid. Um, so uh, let's take a look at this. Um, and, and this story is focused on uh, this girl named Carla. Um, Carla is um, uh, friends with these 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 boys who are on the rugby team. And uh, so while she is at uh, one of these boys' houses, uh, she goes into the bathroom uh, and notice that she spends some time um, uh, concerned with her looks and looking at herself, trying to make herself, you know, putting lipstick on or, 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 or trying to make herself more attractive or what she thinks it would be more attractive to others. Um, and that says something about her character and that motivates many of the things that she does. So character impacts uh, plot significantly. And uh, as Carla moves through this story, um, the incident in the bathroom, in, in the bedroom where, uh, the, the boys are, uh, where she, um, catches them, catches the boys closing the laptop for whatever they're doing. And of course, of course, her curiosity takes over and she wants to know what they were looking at and finds that, uh, on a website, uh, they have been discussing other girls and how attractive they are. Um, which sort of which sort of impacts the way how she looks about herself and realizing that's important because boys uh, want girls to be attractive. Uh, and so she pretends to go out with them, but her curiosity takes over and she wants to know exactly uh, what they're looking at. So she finds this website and all, all the stuff they were, they were looking at. And then she finds them, uh, this video that they have of uh, what I'm assuming is a drunk girl that they are um, mm, being overly familiar uh, with this girl, um, which uh, leads to a conversation with her, her friend, the boy who comes up looking for her. Uh, and, you know, the fact that he realizes that uh, he's been caught, that she has actually seen what he has been doing. He walks out hoping that he can have an understanding with her that, um, you know, it's okay. We're okay. Nothing's wrong. You know, you're, you're, you're not, um, going to tell anybody about this. And of course, then she has that moment of honesty leading to that act of bravery in which she is uncomfortable and tells, uh, perhaps a, a guidance counselor at her school, uh, about what the boys have been doing. Um, that uh, obviously has led to trouble with them. So they, they are spoken to and uh, it is assumed that she is the one who um, brought this trouble on them, that she had told somebody. And because of that, um, these boys were lectured or uh, perhaps given a, um, an ultimatum. I, we don't really know what happened to them, but this leads to her, her, her really um, setting up, again, what we've mentioned in the previous class is that um, she puts her friendship at risk. Um, and it seems like she is willing to sacrifice her friendship and suffer the consequences of her actions, of her being brave. Um, I don't know if you listen to the dialogue very carefully, but, uh, the boys, as they're walking away from something, they said, Oh, do you remember the 12 R's? And they mentioned respect, responsibility, and reasonableness. And so reasonableness, uh, so reflect that respect and responsibility are, are, you know, these ideals that they are looking up to being respectful, being responsible. And yet they're not. They're not living up to those. So they'll tell people, oh, yeah, I'm a, I'm, I'm a good, I don't do anything wrong. But in the privacy of their own rooms, uh, in on their own computers, they are not respectful and not responsible towards others. And so this leads us to, it's like, how do we feel at the end of this? Uh, and, and the emotional response uh, class, uh, this is class number four, yeah, number four. 
Um, we have talked about this in, the, in terms of the response that we have in the end. And that response is that we are proud of her. That she knew that she had to do the right thing um, to protect all the girls out there from being judged and uh, minimalized and uh, being discredited by the boys at their school, uh, some more aggressively than others. Um, and that allows us to think of, the, okay, did she get what she wanted? And the answer is bittersweet because there's a yes and a no. She has her own respect. She knew she did the right thing. But in doing so, she may have lost the friendship of the boy who was, was assuming that, you know, she was she was good with her and that, that they had come to some sort of an agreement that, that, that agreement that she's not going to tell anybody. Um, and the fact that it's, it's important for her, obviously, to be liked because she's constantly judging herself and you know, wanting to be more beautiful. And she's trying to see if she is uh, the type of person that can be attractive to other people. And she must understand the consequences of, of her telling the truth that it can, it might jeopardize her friendship. But I get a sense that from that boy that whose friendship she worried she was going to lose, that he probably respected her considerably and realized that she in the long run was correct. So you've got two stories going on here at the same time. One of them is how she feels about herself and how, you know, wh whether she can maintain this friendship with this boy. Uh, and so we look at those as uh, th there's your resolution uh, toward the end that you get a sense that yes, she did the right thing. And yes, she may have uh, jeopardized the relationship, but in the long run, the, you know, she may have educated him in a way that she can be uh, very proud of herself. And sometimes when we're in the moment, we don't really have that, that sense of understanding where we're going to end up. Um, so her act of bravery uh, is something that we are proud to see, but she's not necessarily sure she made the right decision because we always question ourselves. And that's part of part of plot is that questioning makes us human. Um, and she therefore Yes, she was responsible. Yes, she did the right thing. Yes, she stood up for herself, and that's going to make her proud of herself, and we're proud of her for being for, for doing that as well. Uh, but the other story of the friend is that she may understand that she is much more attractive for being a proud and smart and reasonable and respectful and responsible, you know, uh, person, those, those, those 12 hours of those boys we're talking about, she realized she is living them up, living up to them and they are not. And so what an interesting story um, told from a girl's point of view that really minimizes the boys which is kind of interesting because she's worried that she was not attractive and now she becomes even more attractive because it's not how you look. It's who you are on the inside. Wow. And so a story like this has many layers. Plot is only one of the six ingredients as we've learned in previous class. And so understanding how to put plot and character and conflict and theme and mood and setting all together. That's the joy of storytelling, of being able to figure out how to do it. So having that mountain as our guide, um, hopefully I can be your Sherpa and lead you up the mountain uh, and lead you down safely so that you can climb mountains of your own in the future. And uh, with the knowledge that you have in terms of, of, of how 
a story is constructed. Remember, there, are be, there may be multiple stories going on at the same time with the same characters wanting different things, as in this story. You've got something wanting to do the right thing at the same time, wanting to maintain a friendship with somebody she likes. And she also wants to be attractive, but she learns that, you know, thematically, she learns that there are other things than being physically attractive that make you uh, a beautiful person. So with that in mind, here we go with recommendations. So the plot for a movie can at times get uh, perhaps a little too convoluted. Sometimes it can get confusing. Sometimes it doesn't seem like anything is happening. Uh, the idea of following a movie by what actually is happening may be the way to start to understand what good filmmaking really is. Speaking of good filmmaking, here are five recommendations for films for you to consider when you think about plot. Uh, these are, I've got one from each decade, starting with the 1940s. Uh, so let me start off with the marvelous comedy, uh, His Girl Friday, which is Rosalind Russell and Cary Grant um, doing a slightly different version of the classic The Front Page. Uh, from 1940, this version is maybe the most magnificent dialogue you ever hear. Very snappy banter, very quick, um, and it, it, it happens so fast, the, the, the dialogue, that you don't want to miss a thing. So don't miss it. That's His Girl Friday. Which leads us to the 1950s and a marvelous film starring Humphrey Bogart called The Cane Mutiny, which is based on the play The Cane Mutiny Court Martial, which is uh, about Captain Quig uh, and his, um, his fearfulness, uh, his um, inability to control his thoughts in terms of what is happening to him as the captain of a ship, uh, a Navy, Navy ship, um, and so it's about a court martial. Uh, so almost in a sense, a, a courtroom movie, but on a ship. Uh, and so the plot is a lot of flashbacks because it tries to put things in order so that you can sort of wrap your head around what's going on. Uh, I highly recommend this one. Van Johnson, Fred McMurray, and um, Humphrey Bogart, starring in The Cane Mutiny. And then to 1963, this is a movie that I know a lot of people, once they see it on TV, they cannot stop watching it. Even though they've seen it, you know, a dozen times, they have to keep watching it. The greatest cast ever of film comedians, this, of course, is It's a Mad, 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 Mad World, uh, starring absolutely everybody who was uh, uh, a comic actor in film in the 1960s. Um, it follows the simple idea of chasing down the money. And I will not, I, I imagine almost all of you have seen it already, but go back and watch it again. And if you were to try to write down the plot of what was happening, you'd get tired very quickly because there's so much happening in this movie and it's all wonderful. Uh, which leads to one of my favorite films of the 1970s as well. And speaking of wonderful and chases, it is uh, What's Up, Doc? starring Barbara Streisand and Ryan O'Neill. Uh, it, uh, it is a love letter to San Francisco. Uh, it is a love letter to farce. Um, and it is uh, Peter Bogdanovich's, uh, I don't know if it's his directorial, it's not his directorial debut, but boy, you can tell that this guy knows what he's doing. Um, it is a story of a bag, uh, which just happens to have a twin and a triplet and a quadruplet and a quintuplet. There are five bags that look exactly alike and they get mixed up within uh, a, a number of people. Um, Barbara Streisand, it, it, the, the cast is just, just magnificent. Uh, but Barbara Streisand really carries this movie quite nicely. And if you have, have never seen a film that you liked her in, then you haven't seen this one. This is, this is one, of, one, of, one of the great classic comedies of the 1970s. And then for the 1980s, I've got a film that I doubt you have seen. 
Uh, it is a film that I show in my classes quite a bit. Uh, it is uh, the story of a bully who picks on a kid, a likable kid, uh, and says, you and I are going to meet after school and we're going to fight. The film is, in a sense, a takeoff of High Noon with Gary Cooper, but in the, instead this is called Three O'Clock High. Um, it stars a bunch of uh, teens that you probably don't recognize, uh, and Jeffrey Tambor is probably the, the, the lead male that you would, would recognize from, from anything. He plays a, a teacher. It's a relatively small role. But it is the story of someone's day starting off okay, and then from one incident, everything starts to fall apart. Everything he tries to do to make this problem go away only makes more problems for him. It is the, you know, this is the brilliance of great scripting in which you get so into what's going on and there are so many characters that are trying to help things and only make things worse. <laughs> Um, this, this film always makes me laugh, but it's also, um, really well constructed. And, um, uh, if you pay careful attention to where the character is in his journey in this, uh, of, of how he complicates things, but eventually gets what he wants, um, you, you'll really, I, I think, find this to be a really well-made film. It is beautifully photographed um, by Phil Joano, who is the director, who you really have not heard of since. Um, but please check out Three O'Clock High. High school movie from the 1980s, but it is absolutely worth it. Oh, speaking of worth it, if you uh, are enjoying this series or this particular episode of Film Talk, by all means, um, write to us down below. Uh, you can you can subscribe so that when we get the next one out, you'll get noticed uh, for that. Um, you can write a comment uh, about what you thought about the class or maybe more importantly, your suggestions for films in which plot is really helpful for, you know, to analyze a good movie for plot. And it could be a short film as well as a long film. And if you have a link for a YouTube video, that would be great as well. Uh, and uh, also, before I forget, uh, we are, seeing, seeing as the Martha's Vineyard Film Society is a nonprofit organization, we are uh, looking always for donations um, or grants or uh, sponsors. So if you are one of those people or would like to be one of those people, or if you'd like to be a member of the Martha's Vineyard Film Society, please contact us at www.mvfilmsociety.com. And you can... Uh, you can give us money through our website, or you can check out all the other things, or you can check out other classes. Um, these classes uh, you can watch in pr pretty much any order, but sometimes I'm going to ref reference something from a, a previous epi episode that you might want to go back and check out, uh, as well as all of the various um, recommendations we've had. So with that in mind, uh, I hope you've enjoyed. Uh, we'll be back again with a new episode within the next week. So uh, until then, stay on the path.